Lawrence Norton, who is a deputy director of the democracy program at the Brennan Center for Justice at the NYU School of Law. So, Lawrence. I'm a lawyer at the Brennan Center, which is a uh, policy and legal institute at NYU. We work to improve our democracy, and I'm going to be talking today about a policy problem that has a number of technology challenges associated with it. So I want you to imagine that you've just found your old laptop or mobile phone. When I say old, I mean from 2002. What would happen if you tried to turn it on right now? Well, this isn't as much of a hypothetical as it might sound. In the next year, around the country, people are going to be pulling out computers that are 10, 15, 20 years old and asking us to vote on them. In 2016, 43 states will be using voting machines, computerized voting machines, that are at least a decade old. 14 states will be using computerized voting machines that are at least 15 years old. They are nearly at the end of the projected lifespans or past the end of their projected lifespans. That means that they're more likely to fail, including on election day. And of course, that can lead to long lines. In 2012, between 500 and 700,000 people were not able to vote because of long lines. And the longer we fail to deal with this problem of aging equipment, the worse that problem is likely to get, much worse. Back in 2002, Congress allocated about $2 billion for the United States to update its voting machine infrastructure. Uh, it did so after the Florida election meltdown. Uh, but since that time, we've spent very little on our voting machine infrastructure. So in 2016, while the candidates and their super PACs will probably spend about $10 billion on the election, we'll be lucky if Congress spends $10 million on our voting machine infrastructure. And to give you a sense of how little that is, that's about five cents a voter. So a lot of things need to change. We need to replace this antiquated equipment, and soon. We need our government to start treating voting machine infrastructure the way it treats other critical IT infrastructure, planning and budgeting ahead of time instead of waiting for the next crisis. Uh, but in the longer term, we probably also need to change the voting machine infrastructure itself. Because right now, we're voting on complex, single-use, end-to-end systems. And in a highly regulated, really very small market, that makes voting machines expensive. They cost between five and $10,000 a piece. There are smart people that are working to try to solve this problem. Um, election officials in Los Angeles uh, and in Travis County, which is a, another large county, um, they're hoping to partner with non-traditional vendors to create their own voting systems. Uh, they're hopeful, as many others are, that things like open source software, commercial off-the-shelf hardware can really transform the market. But there are challenges to scaling that kind of thing up to the rest of the country. There are 10,000 election jurisdictions in the United States, and they have very different legal requirements for what a voting machine should be and what it should do. And each election office has very different capabilities. So Los Angeles uh, has a real IT department. Uh, it can maintain, uh, improve, update the voting machine that it creates. But many, many voting jurisdictions in the United States um, don't have a single IT employee uh, in their election offices. There are other challenges as well. Um, we're going to need uh, a new federal voting system guidelines uh, in, in the next couple of years. We need to figure out a way to encourage innovation without sacrificing the security and the usability uh, that we expect for all voters. I'm sure that there are people in this room and in the larger tech community generally who have experiences and perspectives that could help to, uh, to, to answer a lot of these challenges. And I really do hope uh, that some of you will offer your perspectives in the coming months and years. Thanks.